The 1970s, for me, was the golden age of rock. I sailed topographic oceans, I saw the dark side of the moon, sold England by the pound, underwent brain salad surgery, stood in the court of the Crimson King, and even had a beer or two in the Twilight Alehouse. It seemed, back then, almost every week albums were being released that you just had to have, and gigs were happening that you just had to be at. Back then, Uriah Heep always seemed to be in terms of popularity and album sales, kind of in the second tier of bands, just behind the major players like Zeppelin, Sabbath, Toll, Floyd, Yes, etc. Heap were always dismissed, and it used to drive me insane. They were always dismissed in the UK music press as a second-rate boogie band. But us fans knew a little different. When Demons and Wizards was released on the 19th of May 1972, it was the band's fourth album, following Very Heavy, Very Humble, 1970, Salisbury, 1971, and Look at Yourself, also from 1971. And the band had settled in what was, for me, the classic lineup. On lead guitar, Mr. Mick Box. Keyboards, slide guitar, acoustic guitar, backing vocals, and occasionally lead vocals, the great Ken Hensley. David Byron lead vocals, Gary Thane on bass, though former bassist Mark Clark plays on a couple of tracks on Demons and Wizards, Lee Kerslake on drums and backing vocals. Live, Heap were phenomenal. All the band were superb players and superb team players. The harmonies that Byron, Hensley and Kerslake provided were on another level, often sounding like a choir of the gods. Demons and Wizards is often regarded by the fans as Heap's finest moment. Personally, I love it. And it is one of those albums I can still play after almost 50 years and enjoy every second of it. Track 1, The Wizard Throughout the 70s and beyond, many bands have tried to write songs about sword, sorcery, mystical quests. And 90% of it, to me, has always come across as very spinal tap. All a bit pretentious. It takes a rare band, a very rare band indeed, to pull it off successfully. So, don your knee length, silver, platform sole boots and come with me on a little journey. He was the wizard of a thousand kings and I chanced to meet him one night wandering. He told me tales and he drank my wine. Me and my magic man kind of feeling fine. He had a cloak of gold and eyes of fire and as he spoke I felt a deep desire to free the world of its fear and pain and help the people feel free again. Mark Clark plays bass and shares lead vocals with David Byron as the band set their stall out for the rest of the album. The Wizard is packed with great playing, great melodies and those harmonies to die for. Even Byron's quasi-operatic vocals just add to the power of the piece. Starting off, with just acoustic guitar and for this track Ken Hensley used detuned acoustic guitars which makes that unique sound. The track builds and builds to a beautiful climax. So spoke the wizard in his mountain home. The vision of his wisdom means we'll never be alone and I will dream of my magic night and a million silver stars that guide me with their light. Track number two, one of my all-time favourite songs, Traveller in Time, which kicks off with an absolute monster of a riff. Mick Box bashing that wah-wah pedal like there's no tomorrow, Ken Hensley on organ, Thane providing superb and powerful bass, and Lee Kerslake smashing those cymbals like there's no tomorrow. All of this just sets it up for David Byron to enter with those impossibly high vocals. Every day I have to look at the sun to see where it was that I came from. I have a feeling that there must be a time when I'll get a chance to go home because I'm so tired of being here alone. But I'm just a traveller in time trying so hard to pay for my crime. 
like I said earlier, in the wrong hands, this could all sound over the top and pretentious, but the band turn in a tour de force, and the track still sounds as magical today as it did back in 1972. As the track comes to a finish, Mick Box, superb on Wild Wild Guitar, leads the band through some very prog rock changes. One note about Mick Box, one of Rock's gentlemen, in an interview recently, he said that one of his greatest moments as a musician is when people come up to him and say, Mick, I picked up a guitar, I started playing guitar because of you. Now Mick, while being a great player, he's never seemed kind of out of reach like some guitar heroes. And as I said before, he's one of Rock's gentlemen. If you want to talk to Mick, he's always accessible. He's just a really, really lovely guy. Track number three, Easy Living. Now, this should have been a massive, massive hit for the band. I still can't believe that it only reached number 39 in the US charts, and it was just a moderate hit in Europe. The track's origins come from when the band were driving home one night from a gig, cold, tired, crammed into the back of a van. David Byron commented, Nothing like the easy life, eh guys? Everyone laughed, and Ken Hensley wrote it down, and that's how one of Rock's classic tracks was born. It's basically a fast shuffle, driven along by Lee Kerslake's monster drumming and Ken Hensley's searing organ chords. When the band played this live, it was impossible not to get up on your feet and start moving. It would blow the roof off the place. When I first saw the band perform this live, I thought there's no way they can reproduce the vocal harmonies from the record live on stage but you know what they did and it was just unbelievable I always thought that Queen borrowed a hell of a lot from Uriah Heep you've got to remember Queen's debut album was released the very next year and on that subject while doing some research recently for this video I watched some Uriah Heep live and if you look at David Byron and his stage persona and then go to early Queen Freddie Mercury on stage. I think you'll see a lot of similarities. I think Freddie observed David Byron a hell of a lot. Track four, Poets Justice. And for me, the influence on Queen is very apparent as the track opens and more of those wonderful, wonderful layered harmonies. Then straight into another driving organ and guitar riff. When I listen to Ken Hensley's songwriting in this period, you can see how much he was influenced by late 60s UK pop, especially when it comes to melody. Now, if you can blend great melody and killer hooks into one of the most powerful rock bands out there, you've got a killer combination. And that's exactly what Hensley did with this album. Another huge part of Heap's chemistry at this time was the exceptional bass playing of Gary Thane. Throughout the whole album, Gary provides great melodic bass lines. Before Heap, Gary was part of the Keith Hartley band. And if you like great blues playing, they really are worth checking out. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, the UK blues scene was really popping with bands like Keith Hartley, John Mayall, providing a, a school, really, for great guitarists and great musicians generally. So if you like that sort of blues, like I say, UK blues, check out Half Breed by the Keith Hartley Band. You won't be disappointed. Gary's great bass playing is all over Poets Justice. At 2 minutes 35 seconds in, we have some beautiful twin harmonised lead guitars, followed by some crazed Hensley organ playing, which leads us into a magical sequence of Mick playing higher and higher notes on his guitar and David Byron mirroring it with his voice, matching it note for note. It is just unbelievable. Another Uriah Heep classic track. Circle of Hands is another mystical piece by Ken Hensley. It's all about finding love, riding our lands, keeping our enemies at bay. And it all fits in perfectly with the mood of the album. 
as the band take us through various vocal and instrumental passages. Like I said at the beginning, over the years, many, many bands have tried to do this sort of material, but to pull it off and pull it off successfully, you've got to have massive balls, a lot of style, and a hell of a lot of panache. Ken Hensley. The band were really focused at this time. We all wanted the same thing. We were all willing to make the same sacrifices to achieve it, and we were all very, very committed. It was the first album to feature that lineup, and there was a magic in that combination of people that created so much energy and enthusiasm. Next up, Rainbow Demon, which opens with some doomy Hammond organ chords. There rides the Rainbow Demon on his horse of crimson fire. Black shadows are following closely on the heels of his desire. One minute 32 seconds in, Ken Hensley changes the pace of those organ chords as Kerslake and Thane provide a marching rhythm and off we go. Rainbow Demon, pick up your heart and run. Rainbow Demon lives for his sword and his gun. It's always sounded on this song that Ken Hensley shares lead vocals with David Byron. And you feel that they could sing the Greater London Telephone Directory and it would still sound absolutely amazing. When this album came out, I was very much into the writings of Robert E. Howard. He's the guy who created Conan, Conan the Barbarian. And he also wrote another bunch of sword and sorcery novels. He's worth checking out. If you love sword and sorcery and all this mystical stuff, Robert E. Howard is like a don of that genre. Next up, All My Life. It's a fun piece written by Byron, Box and Kerslake and features Box on lead guitar and Ken Hensley on slide. I had a little look for a minute today and I told there was something that I wanted to say. Just sitting there glowing with her red light on so I gotta move fast and it shouldn't take long. Maybe she will, maybe she won't. You gotta get yourself together cause she doesn't say don't. The song certainly allows David Byron to show the full range of his vocal talents. And a song like this, though enjoyable, would seem a bit of a filler, unless the band were on absolutely top form. Next up, Paradise, which starts off sounding like it came straight from a Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young record. All layered acoustic guitars, soft drums, and those wonderful Gary Thane bass lines. To my ears, again, David Byron and Ken Hensley taking turns at lead vocals. And here you can see, especially on this track, what an original songwriter Ken Hensley was. The song takes various unexpected twists and turns in the melody and the chorus. It's just a beautiful little composition. And like I said, it shows what an original songwriter Ken Hensley was. And so to the final track, The Spell. Now, some people have, over the years, cited this as the inspiration for Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, I can't quite see that, but like I said earlier, I do see that Queen borrowed a lot from your eye heap. So, it might be possible. The spell kicks off with an organ riff that has always reminded me of an intro to one of those awful game shows we had in the UK in the 1970s. Then it kind of morphs into a jumpy pop rock piece. Think sweet, 10cc, and you won't be far off the mark. One minute, 35 seconds in, we're just left with solitary piano. Soon to be joined by Ken Hensley on sly guitar. Now, when people talk about Ken Hensley, they often forget what a great slide player he was. I mean, he really was an exceptional slide guitarist. And he takes us into distinctively Pink Floyd territory. All this is backed by Hensley and Byron's multi-track vocals. And they sound like a heavenly choir. Back we go to that solitary piano and Byron's vocals. But when the night is over and daytime steals your cover, the goodness of the morning sun will warm away what you have done and leave you cold. I have no need for moonlight, you're wrong to trust in sunlight, for I exist not just in storms, but in life itself, 
so many forms to leave you cold. And then we revisit the jumpy pop rock of the first minute of the song and Byron informs us, let us not begin this fight we cannot win. Be sure you're watching me because all through your life, every day and every night, you should know that I'll be watching you. Now I must admit, it took me a little while to get used to all the bits of this song and how they fitted together. But after a while, it all fell into place. And when I saw them live, this was a tour de force. It was incredible. The band just played out of their socks and everything fitted into place. And somehow again, in concert, live, they managed to reproduce those wonderful, wonderful harmonies. So there you have it. Probably for me, like I said at the beginning, the classic Uriah Heap album. One thing I'd like to add at the finish of this piece, I think that in the early days of Uriah Heap, they seemed so pushed to bring out albums one after another. And I always felt as good as a lot of the albums were, what would they have been like if they'd have had more time to develop? Fantastic band and great music. Rest in peace, Ken Hensley. And thank you for all the wonderful music that you gave us over the years. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.